Thanks, y'all. I do not have a PowerPoint. I have no, um, it would just be, I'm a comedian, so it would just be a PowerPoint of me telling jokes. Um, and, but I will say, okay, so yeah, I'm Debbie. I'm the um, artistic and executive director of Peacock Rebellion. Peacock Rebellion um, is a crew of queer and trans people of color, primarily trans femmes of color, um, based in East Oakland. Um, and we crack jokes for social justice. Um, that is kind of what we do. Um, and that's part of what we do. We're a very many tentacled beast, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. But I do want to shout out um, Lexi adds it. Lexi's our managing director. She's here. This is her. Lexi's famous. Lexi, here she is. Um, so, yeah, OK. Um, so a little bit about this Peacock situation. So um, why we're called Peacock Rebellion first is um, it's like a slap in the face to Charles Darwin. So Charles Darwin like wrote this like letter to one of his to like a lover about how peacocks were like irrelevant um be, and like ostentatious and like just too like shimmery and whatever for evolution they have made no like ev evolutionary sense and then years later um he like wrote this retraction that's like kind of dismissed by history that um by a lot of it that was about like oh actually they had really, peacocks have really complex communication styles, um, and I just didn't understand. And they're the all, you know, various kind of things, um, ways that, that um, from the visual aesthetics to the, you know, um, a lot of other things. So the other about peacocks, you know, um, were taken from India and, and you know, were, were um, caged for British enjoyment um, and were genetically modified. So now there are um, white peacocks um, uh, that was, um, anyway, yeah, there's there's a lot of things that are happening uh, with that. Peacock Rebellion, I am snarky enough to actually start an organization just despite um, this dead white man. So. Um, the other thing is I am my family tree on one side of a family tree. Um, one side of my family, it's the only uh, family tree we, we have traced. I am the 16th in a gener uh, 16th generation storyteller. So um, family, we often, we lived in an accordion household. We had um, relatives living with us um, constantly. And dinners would take like five hours. And I was not allowed to talk. So now I feel like I'm making up for lost time with just like elaborate five hour long stories just about my day um, that are unnecessary. And Lexi knows about that. Um, and so, so that's part that's part of it. And then the other thing is how I got into comedy was because I grew up in a town in Pennsylvania where the main extracurricular activity was the KKK. So I started cracking jokes to survive. And I still do. So. I had, you know, I did undergrad in like um, at a whatever at a school in um, central Pennsylvania that was like clan clan school clan clan clan. Um, so it was it was great. Um, and I I started I I got politicized um, community organizing and started and then I worked for someone in D.C. who was my idol uh, until I worked for her. Um, and I was working on this giant march. Um, and I was going to like from one town to another to another um, and my time off in my time off I well I'll, I'll actually get I'll backtrack a little bit so I was going from one town to another and I had like a field staff across the US and I thought I was fancy and I was like the national organizer and like all this stuff and what I was ended up doing was I was actually kind of telling our local organizers on the ground what our movement was going to be, what our national position was going to be. That was my order, rather than actually having like a grassroots kind of um, uh, some actual grassroots work and leadership. And I was midway through this like stump speech in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and I always, the stump speech, you know, I'll throw in local references and all that stuff. Um, and I was midway through the speech when someone very like politely, because it's Madison, um, was like, was like, excuse me, I don't want to interrupt, but do you realize you're in Chicago? And I was so, <laughs> so burnt out. I had no idea where I was. And so I went home to my hotel, uh, that was home, um, at 2 a.m. And I started writing a musical comedy about the nonprofit industrial complex. 
by the ways that nonprofits are used and intentionally the structures of, of the nonprofit industry was was used to um, uh, to attack, control, and destroy mass-based movements um, for transformative social change. So that, and then I burnt out in DC after that job and I was like, where do people have things figured out? The Bay, <laughs> oh, everything figured out. Um, so I came here for grad school, for my first grad school. And um, so that was 40,000, uh, that, that, <laughs> that school shut down, but I got my degree. It was misspelled, but I got my degree. And um, I, and then I wanted to do um, art. I wanted to do like art stuff, you know? And um, I did an MFA and it was like this like social justice performing arts program, fancy. And I was like, this is perfect. Um, and I spent one semester there and realized I was spending more time organizing students and faculty of color to deal with institutional racism than I was working on my art. So I was like, okay, if I'm gonna spend another forty, fifty thousand dollars and go into debt for the rest of my life, I might as well just start an organization instead, because clearly that's gonna happen with the nonprofit anyway. So um so I dropped out of my MFA program and um and started Peacock Rebellion because I was seeing that um queer and trans people of color were not getting um I wanted I wanted us to have access to really high quality free training uh to have a training institute for us where we didn't have to kind of tap dance we didn't have to go through and take on all this debt and you know um to actually get access to this this is one and then uh, the other part of it was that I wanted um I realized I was a really terrible community organizer, just terrible, bad, you know, bad. And so I was, so I guess the soundbite with it is that I was more effective with a microphone than a megaphone, you know? So like I couldn't get, um, I wasn't great at a march or a demo or a protest, but I could use my comedy to actually get people to a march or a demo or a protest who wouldn't get there or to move social justice messages. And um, so then with Peacock that, that beautiful music com musical comedy that I had written based on, I started collecting stories and I collected about 2,000 of them. That turned into this gorgeous musical that is now sitting on a shelf collecting dust. I've never done it. Um, because instead, we decided to do a cabaret show. Um, and it was called Agency, Nonprofit Dreams and Disasters. And it was at La Peña in 2012. And um, people actually had to to go into the like the room of La Pena. They actually had to go in as if they were registering for a conference. So like once they got their ticket, they go through this assembly line like terrible, which I'm sure no one in this room can relate to. Um, you know, and the, and like we had like a speak, you know speakers with the terrible you know the introductions and whatever conference packets and the, and the whole thing. And then the and then we had PowerPoints that were like the People of Color Caucus has been like you know relocated to the broom closet. You know, so like all of these things are going on, it's frantic and it was it was great. And we got, that was the, that was my my very first public call out. Ah, oh, tear. Um, I still remember it because some folks were like, oh, you didn't solve the nonprofit industrial complex. And I was like, it's a 90 minute show. What are you, you know? Um, but that was that was the origin that of, um, of Peacock. And then in 2013, um, so that show was in fall of 2012. And then in 2013, we did, um, it was the summer of the Zimmerman case. And also a lot of my friends were being um, targeted, a lot of femmes were being targeted, um, queer and trans uh, femmes of color were being targeted um, around a, a very specific thing. And I got my second public call out. And instead of that, and that was within queer and trans people of color community. And I was like, okay, like I could respond to this by like, you know, battling a call out with a call out or, you know, whatever. But what if we did something Okay, how do I use this? How do I process this in my um, art? So we did a cabaret show and um, we called it Tender Fest, a queer and trans people of color community love extravaganza. And it's at a, it was at a, at a Cutie Park uh, queer and trans PLC space in West Oakland that has since been shut down because of gentrification um, called the Living Room Project. And um, instead of an alcohol bar, we had a tincture bar. We used, um, we had things like uh, using the forms of cabaret to actually teach yoga postures um, for when folks are uh, triggered by racist microaggressions. We had um, practicing like consensual daps, like um, fist bumps and, and various, um, a lot of other things, like really like really locating um, 
uh, try, using it as a space to practice. Um, so that was 2013, and then I ran into someone I really admired, a stand-up comedian, um, which is almost no one. I, most stand-up comedy, I think, is trash. I do not like it. I think it goes to the lowest common denominator. It's like, oh, the, this joke is going to be racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, fatphobic, check, 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 check. So, um, but there was someone I really liked, and I ran into her at People of Color Meditation Night at my meditation center, because of course, it's the Bay. And so um, that's so, and I was like, hey, her name is Misha Mosley. And I was like, Misha, I've always wanted to start a stand-up comedy core, and then we actually go out and go into places um, where, uh, that have like recent hate incidents and stuff. And, because um, that's also my background, is that a lot of my work was, um, in the past was um, trauma, um, going to places that have been, um, targeted by the Klan and World well, Church the Creator and Skidheads, that kind of stuff, immediately afterwards and try to do some trauma support, um, support work. So I was like, what if we actually used, we trained a core of people to use and move these messages and, and work on, um, on some trauma healing? And she was like, all right, sure, I have a free couple weeks. So, um, so we did that. We started a training program, um, and we called it Brouhaha. Uh, it was like a little activist rumble, you know, um, and that program, Lexi was actually in that very first program in spring of 2014, and it, that was, uh, we held the shows at African American Art and Culture Complex in the Fillmore in San Francisco, and um, Nia King was also a co-trainer, Vanessa Rochelle Lewis was our um, co-producer, and um, yeah, we talked about things. We we implemented a system. So our jokes um, take from BDSM. We use a red light, yellow light, green light process. So red light is like that's punching down, right? Like that's the racist, sexist, transphobic, all that stuff we won't allow on our stages. Yellow light is kind of like it's either kind of like lateral. It'll be like a, like a lateral racism thing or internalized um, stuff. Or the joke is just not funny enough, um, which is arbitrarily based on whatever the queen and on her throne decides. Um, and then um, and then green is what we're going for. All the jokes are supposed to be actively punching up at the system. We're trying to talk about jokes that, uh, we're trying to use jokes and, and bits and, and build out these sets that are telling a narrative and that are um, trying to tell a really complex story about things like, about structural violence. Um, so our shows are not easy. Um, they, they can be a tough, uh, the content is hard. Uh, um, it's uncomfortable. So, um, but that first, what was also uncomfortable is behind the scenes, there's like a lot of transphobic kind of stuff happening behind the scenes. So Lexi dropped out of the program. And the next year, um, I approached uh, a friend um, who we'll call Luna, because that's her name, Luna. Um, so Luna, um, to do to completely redo the Brujaha program and to have it all be trans women of color. And so the first year was stand-up comedy, the second year was comedy storytelling, and um, and so and Luna recommended Lexi as co-producer. So then we then that was the first, and that became Brujaha. That became the first trans women of color um, performing arts show, like in the US, like ever, which is like kind of sad that it took till 2015 to like for that to happen, you know, but, um, you know, and then, um, yeah, and we merged the cohorts in 2016 to try to go to this, this special show. Um, and since then, we've, we've really expanded. So now um, we'll use the, the themes of the show to, uh, try to get people to donate directly to trans women of color, show up for court support, actually take action, um, come to a march or a demo or a protest, um, and it's working. So we, this winter we had Tenderfest 2.0. It was a trans people, a two-day trans people of color dance and music festival. Um, a couple of weeks before that, one of the artists was arrested um, and charged with felonies for defending herself against an attacker. And, um, we did not organize her defense campaign. She did, actually, from jail. And her mom uh, did, who was also one of our artists. And um, TGI Justice Project, who's a really works, works really closely with us. And um, we, 
Um, but what we did do, one thing that Peacock were really good at is getting our base to do things. <laughs> so we did at least get like hundreds of people to email the, you know, um, email the DA and slam the phone lines of the DA and the judge and show up for court support. We shut down the rest of the organization to, to focus on this. And um, uh, yeah, and actually charges were dropped. All, all the charges were dropped and she was released within 48 hours, which we know is kind of a very rare thing. And I don't want to normalize that or say that that's really common, particularly for black trans women um, in the US. So, but in this, in this situation, it was highly effective. And like people power really believe it's like really, really highly effective. Last year, um, Lexi was already on the East Coast. Um, we were getting ready to do this show at this fancy school um, on the East Coast. But before that, we, um, uh, Lexi was like, you have a lot to do or whatever. Um, and I was like, it's totally manageable as long as nothing else happens and nothing else gets added to my plate, um, which I doomed us. Um, so then I get to the office and there's an email from my landlord saying, I'm gonna sell our building. I'm gonna sell it in 90 days and I want you all to buy it. And so I was like, sure, you know, whatever, like put on my credit card. Um, so the block that we are on is in the lower San Antonio, lower San Antonio district, um, 46 languages and dialects spoken. It is actually a working class um, neighborhood of color has been defended and protected for a very long time. And um, it's directly along a path of gentrification. There's a new bus rapid transit thing that's, that's being planned all the way International Boulevard um, in Oakland from San Leandro to downtown Oakland. Um, they just put in this week fiber optic stuff under our street and we're like, oh, we know who this is for. This has never been, you know, never been for the folks in the neighborhood um, before. So we talked to everybody who, we, who would listen and who's on this block is, um, or in this building is um, groups that have been there for like 15, 20 years. People have been in the building for, for a really long time. People have raised children in the building um, who, are not, who are grown now. So, and then there's like cycles of change. It's a community bike shop collectively run largely by people who grew up in the neighborhood. There's Shaolin, like actual Shaolin monks. Um, uh, and uh, Peacock Rebellion is based there, liberating ourselves locally, which is a queer and trans POC makerspace. Um, so, and then Seoul, which is, runs a community garden there, queer and trans people of color, and then affordable housing um, on top. So we talked to everybody who would listen and including government officials who were like, oh, I once heard this like yesterday, I talked a little bit about this, but um, was like, um, pat us on, you know, like, oh, you cute kids. And we're like, okay, well, some of our lead organizers are in their 70s, but like, whatever, cute kids. Um, so they're like, yeah, you're going to, you think you're going to pull this off. And so instead we reached out to our base, um, to all the organizations, to our, our communities and they, their communities um, raised it was $90,000 in eight weeks from 600 people, um, which was enough for us to put down a deposit on the building. And so we got a lot of press from this and uh, and then government officials started like latching on to it because um, uh, we know it's an election year, um, things are coming up. So we're like, okay, we're gonna be used. How can we leverage that? So we um, Pressure, we, we got our, 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 our constituents, our, our community to put pressure on City of Oakland to also give us a loan, which we then, and then we partnered with the land trust. So in fact, 90 days after this, we first heard about it, um, we put down a deposit on, on, um, on this building. And then finally it took like, you know, to put together the financing and all this stuff. Um, on November 28th, we signed the lease and we are now, it's the pro plan, the, Campaign was called Liberate 23rd Ave because um, the idea is that it's a it's um, essentially a collective of collectives or a, you know a co-op of co-ops because um, we can never ever sell the building, we can never sell the land. Um, it is going to be in trust forever, and for us to be an asset, uh, we didn't want it to be. A lot of nonprofits, especially like arts nonprofits, are like we need to stay here so that we can you know be another stage of gentrification and and we're like okay so we actually want to actively disrupt that um, and for us to be an asset it means that like first we have to actually be invited by the local community so we were peacock was invited to actually be on the block um so we got there and then two we actually have to be responsible to the local community so to the lower san antonio to the block that, that kind of stuff um and uh 
yeah, so this is actually going to be a majority queer and trans people of color um, space with all these organizations and affordable housing is gonna be in the community, not for five or 10 or 20 years, but for the next hundred years. And we wanna think about that because um, when so many of our folks are erased, like I, I'm 36, I actually did not imagine that I would live this long for, for most of my life, you know? Um, and so to think about like, are, are people actually surviving whatever is coming in the political climate and, you know, and all this stuff. I mean, like, no, we deserve to actually think in those ways. Um, and to like, you know, as, as um, the homie said about like, you know, we, we need to write ourselves into the future. And it's not enough to just write ourselves into the future. I think um, for us, as so many queer and trans POC arts organizations are shutting down, uh, for us, we're like, it's, it's a, and, you know, we're about to like lay me off. Um, so we're trying to be really creative about how we can um, stay. We totally need to do it. I see your face, Lexi. We totally need to leave. All right, well, we'll talk about it. All right, processing. So um, for us, you know, the choice also about like kind of just opening the door a little bit to like, we, we could we could have been like, okay, well this year we're gonna have like three trans women of color in the thing. Instead, what we wanna do is because we know resources are so scarce, are so scarce or whatever it is, um, we we wanna start first with, um, we're gonna start first with trans women of color and trans femmes of color and expand from there and have our responsibilities, think about what our responsibilities to, um, to show up for folks who have actually built movements on their back. Um, so, yeah, that's some of what I do. I did bring some of my comedy, but I feel like it might be um, a little inappropriate, a little bit. It's, so I operate, most of my comedy is like really raunchy. Um, and I'm like, you know, I'll be like raunchy, 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 abolish prisons, raunchy, you know? And people are like, okay, well, you had the raunchy joke, so maybe, yeah, yeah, let's abolish prisons. Um, Oh crap, I think I actually took it out. Sorry, you all. Um, anyway, I promise I'm funny. Oh no, here it is. I get paid to be funny, but I'm off the clock today. Um, so all serious. Um, I guess maybe I'll pause there. I want to check time and if we have time for in a group. Can we? Something, all right. Um, let's see what I can do that is appropriate. I have not, that's nothing, nothing, <laughs> nothing. Okay. Um, okay. Maybe I'll do, okay. All right, I know what I'll do. But I also need some like interaction, you know, I, I need it to be, like, don't be San Francisco. So I, I need, no. this is East Bay. I need some, some noise with this. So um, Berkeley, can you make some noise? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, how's everyone doing today? Okay, well, I'm a train wreck, so good for you. Thank you. Um, because people keep telling me to be patient. Like, we need to be patient and just ride out the next few years. Like, maybe it won't be so bad. I kind of feel like good and bad depends on your baseline a little bit. Because I keep running around like I'm on Game of Thrones. Like, winter is coming! Um, and some people are like, you know, at least we still have Netflix. And so this is why I fly into a rage. Um, okay, that one didn't work. Okay, so do, 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 do. okay, so a little about me. I'm Devi. I'm 36 years old. That is too young to be like an established, respected elder, um, but just old enough to be put on a sad glacier of irrelevance and floated off to sea. That's just kind of the window in queer years, apparently. Um, I'm Buddhist. I was raised Hindu fundamentalist, um, but I converted because, you know, YOLO. Um, all right. Uh, usually I'm, you know, like I, I tried that joke a couple of times and the only people who have laughed so far are like the three Buddhists in the crowd who are like, reincarnation joke, yay! <laughs> Everyone else is like, I don't, I don't, that's not funny. Um, and the thing with Buddhism in the West uh, that, that gets me really frustrated, a lot of Buddhism in the U.S. is like just little bits skimmed off the top. It's like bood light, really. It's, uh, it's lower calorie, but why bother? Um, 
so the idea of don't intervening in people's people's karma that's that's like let like let's let's meditate away the oppression let's just let's just fucking i breathe in deportations i breathe out rupaul's drag race i breathe in police brutality i breathe out kale and so this this is why I need meditation more, because I get angry. Um, this summer, I'll be flying a lot. Uh, I'm making mental notes of all the pre-security things, you know, like get out my laptop and take off my shoes and put in my anal probe, as one does. <laughs> and I'm scared, not just because I bought the probe gently used. <laughs> RIP Craigslist. Um, because every time I open my suitcase, the notes from TSA get increasingly more passive aggressive. So the latest one was like, dear customer. Oh, OK. So in my head, the TSA is British, because wherever my people go, you can never escape. <laughs> dear customer, we took your condoms. You clearly won't be getting laid. Mm -hmm. We left your socks and lube. Sincerely, TSA. <laughs> Fuck you, TSA. You know me better than I know myself. Oh, sad. Um, let's see what else. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with porn. I don't know if I want to hook up with the actors or teach them theater games. It's a little, it's a little of both, really. Um, although with the, all these absurd new anti-sex work laws, now I just want to throw all my sex worker friends a crowdfunder, but also that seems to be banned too. So um, I guess I can't really even say get some cash to sex workers today, but um, talk to me after the after the talk. Uh, we'll arrange it. Um, uh, okay, so I signed back up for OkCupid because I reached the end of Tinder. Um, so. For those unfamiliar, when you get to the end of Tinder, the screen flashes, you won, game over. <laughs> and the game is over, because all you win is carpal tunnel and a lifetime of cats. That's, um, that's about it. Um, almost all the messages on OkCupid I get are from white people. To the next white boy who hits on me by calling me Curry, I. Um, I want to be like, so here's a map of all the countries where curries are commonly eaten. And next, mix, let's make a list of different types of curry, because I need more information from you. Um, OK, so I'll stop there. That's a little bit of, um, of, the, of a set that I'm, I'm working on, that I'm developing. Thank you. Um, I know, I'm like, I'm trying to, it's like trying to cut down most of the inappropriate stuff. But left a little bit in there. Um, so we try to use that stuff to to then like move a, some kind of message. So right now, actually, what's happening is the city of Oakland is rewriting their cultural plan for the first time in 30 years. And um, public comment period, if anyone uh, is, is living, for those living in Oakland, public comment period closes tomorrow. And if you didn't know about this, that's on purpose. So um, Peacock tomorrow is actually dropping on our email list our policy recommendations. Uh, I think I brought a copy of the executive summary of the plan and what what's um, the plan, which might be for the next 30 years. I did. OK. Um, it's called Belonging in Oakland, a cultural development plan executive summary. Um, so this executive summary, if you want to check it out, uh, the highlights, I guess the main highlight is it's trash. It's trash is terrible. <laughs> It, um, it's basically, it's like talking about equity and cu cultural equity, but there's actually no, um, there's no policy or there's no way to actually enforce it or actually make it happen. Whereas in the city of San Francisco, there's actually a cultural equity ordinance that has been so powerful. Queer Cultural Center taught me really well. Um, I used to work there, uh, you know, and, and I got to see actually how money was moved into communities of color using this cultural equity ordinance. It's really powerful. So we are making recommendations as Peacock Rebellion to, um, to, to actually put in comments. If you're interested in that, actually have uh, one copy of the, our policy recommendations. We've been involved in this process. Otherwise, if you want on our, um, to get on your list or whatever, you'll see it tomorrow. 
um, yeah, we're trying to get as many comments as we can. So yeah, sure. Yeah, I don't have the contact info of the, that would have been good organizing, but we already established that's not me. Um, but yeah, we can put that up and maybe I'll put it on our Facebook and stuff, or I don't know if people use, whatever it is. Um, I'll put some stuff on our social media and things too, our Snapchat. I don't even know how to use Snapchat. I don't know how to, I don't even know how to log into my computer. Um, but anyway, um, oh, and then the, also pl the plan if anybody wants to kind of check it out. So if nothing else, uh, please, if you can, um, submit some comments and we'll, we'll tell you how, uh, just so we can get some cash uh, to communities of color in Oakland long term. Okay, thanks.